You know these talks where they provide you with, uh, the, the speakers provide you with answers, with uh, how-tos, with uh, um, solutions to certain problems. Um, at hack events like MCH, there are also these talks where, they don't where the speakers don't provide you with, uh, with, with answers, but they just pose interesting questions. The next talk is one of those talks. Um, so, the next speaker is, is, is going to provide us with questions and directions on how we could encode uh, and what social model in the infrastructure we build. So please welcome with a very warm round of applause, Eleanor and Freedom, Ownership, Infrastructure and Hope. <laughs> Hi there. So uh, this, this will be, as noted, a slightly different talk. Hopefully there will be some interesting questions that you get coming out of it. Um, there are no slides. Instead, you can just view some beautiful, well, you probably can't see it because daylight, but overview effect um, in the background. So first, kind of a historical note of how I came to be here giving this talk. I'm a kid who grew up with Bucky Fuller and climate modeling and a bunch of other stuff. And I spent a while thinking about governance and um, well, I guess detour via commercial security world, did a bunch of early threat modeling work, that kind of thing. And I spent a while thinking about governance and how do we build governments? How do they actually get structured? Um, you know, I did a, a bunch of that thinking was happening in the context of the Arab Spring and Occupy. Uh, I spent some time with Smari trying to rebuild the Icelandic constitution into something more useful. Um, and I spent a bunch of time in the NGO world. And you know, doing security for activists and news organizations who are being targeted by nation states. And eventually I got really burnt out and quit and went back to the commercial world because I was tired of not being able to solve the problem. You know, it's, it's one thing doing the kind of work where you know that your best case is that you reduce the likelihood that the people that you're trying to take care of die, where it's a statistical reduction and that's your best outcome. But we weren't even really getting that. You know, we were not doing the work suitable to solve the problem. And I've sort of come to think of, of NGOs as the bards of the 21st century's form of epic, tragic poetry. You know, they write all of these white papers and, you know, charts and graphs and presentations and that kind of stuff that chronicle the ongoing decline of human civilization, which is a nice job, I guess. You know, I think they could probably do a bit better with actual poetry, but that's basically what they're doing. Um, and so let's talk a bit about our current moment. So, as you may have noticed, we're dealing with a massive resurgence of fascism across Europe and across America, and really seemingly across most, pl most places. Uh, the US is preparing for its first large-scale queer genocide, which is probably gonna start in a couple of years. Um, we are dealing with an explosion of oligarchs, right? We have added an amazing number of billionaires over the course of this first half of this pandemic. Um, which is not actually great for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about. Um, and if we want to maintain globally organized human civilization, we have about seven and a half years to get to carbon zero. Now, most people say net zero, but it's kind of questionable these days because it turns out that most of the offsets are junk and that carbon capture and storage is never going to be viable at scale because it requires wildly too much energy. And uh, we can't build reactors fast enough, right? You start a new reactor project right now, even if you waive the permitting process and you're just looking at construction, it's gonna take 20 years. So nuclear is irrelevant, um, regardless of what you think about it otherwise. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that we've kind of figured out, like uh, we finally have an estimate of how much methane gets leaked globally. And it turns out that once you account, you know, uh, once you account methane leakage, liquid natural gas is worse than coal. We're literally better off spinning up all the coal-fired power plants because that doesn't leak into the upper atmosphere. Um, so there's a lot of stuff where our, we keep realizing that our situation is, is worse than it previously was. And uh, 
And this is, you know, and a lot of this is also driving a lot of the rising fascism, a lot of this kind of stuff. We live in an uncertain world, and in an uncertain world, people look to strong leaders who are willing to shoot the other, um, which is great when you're the other. Um, so if you look at the... Um, there are three estimates in the recent IPCC report which are in the probable window. And if you look at the worst of those three estimates, we will cross two degrees in 18 years in 2040. Now, a two-degree world is already catastrophic. I'm not going to go into the details. You can read all the summaries. Now, think about the Syrian refugee crisis. That was 6.9 million people leaving Syria. Think about 350 million people in the next 18 years becoming international refugees, right? 50 times that number of people. Think about what Europe, think about what Fortress Europe is going to do in response to that. We're going to see gunboats in the Mediterranean shooting anything that moves automated, right? Who know, I mean, the, the impact of that on our society, if we end up going down that trajectory, and if we keep thinking about the world from a frame of ownership, from a frame of we've got ours, is not good. I do not want to live in a world where the EU kills a couple hundred million people for trying to escape a place where they can't live anymore. So there is some hope. Um, there's actually a lot of hope, because it turns out that the technical transition is entirely possible. None of this is a technical problem. And even the bits that are a technical problem, we still keep finding new and new cool things. Um, last year, a Saudi team figured out that you can extract lithium from seawater. So we don't need to mine lithium anymore. It's actually all of that whole resource crisis specifically about lithium is gone. And the process is so cheap, and it produces chlorine and a couple of other things as byproducts, that the, the lithium itself is almost free. Um, so yeah. Grid-scale batteries, not actually going to be a particularly big deal. This is genuinely, amazingly good news. And there's a lot of that stuff out there. Um, we finally had a hybrid lift vehicle get, its, um, get commercial funding, right? So, you know, air travel, yes, it's at the third the speed, but you can carry 20 times as much. And uh, per passenger mile, if you're looking at it for, for air passengers, it's like a tenth of the carbon, right? And for shorter trips, they can run entirely hybrid. So we probably get to keep air travel even, right? Like, there's, there's genuinely a lot of good news in there if we actually act. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things, one of the, the complexities of this is that transition requires infrastructure equality, right? We here in this world live in a world where everything works for us. That is not how most of the world works. Things are going to need to get a lot more equal, and in most part, that means that everybody else needs to get brought up to speed significantly, because that's the only way that we can make a green transition work, right? You know, yes, there's some leapfrogging, you can build microgrids, you can do this, you can do that, but the end impact is significantly more equality of structure. Now, the problem is us, basically, right? The problem that we are dealing with, the reason why we are putting human civilization into an early grave is that we are a bunch of rich assholes who want to own the world. And I say we because I mean us. I mean all of us, not just here, but across the first world, right? That, you know, if we were willing to play ball properly, there's a lot of motivation around the places that are going to die first to, like, fix things. And it's not a technical problem. We just have to choose to do the work. We have to choose that we would rather live than be rich. And specifically, the problem is all of those new billionaires. I mean, it's also us, but it's them too. It's them most specifically, because the oligarchs are starting to plan for a, tra a transition. They're starting to plan for an oligarchy preserving transition, where they keep their position in the power structure and possibly even improve it. And that means a genocide, right? Not, not necessarily an intentionally shooting people genocide. It just, you know, things happen to populations sometimes. You know, which to be fair, humans have been doing for a very long time. All of us are the heirs of literally dozens of genocides in the historical record. As my friend Quinn says, it's one of the things that makes us uniquely human is that we commit so many genocides, just 
like dozens of them in the average century, you know? And, and you know, that's, that's the thing that is unique from the animal kingdom. Lots, lots of other stuff, not genocides. Um, but anyway, so let's, so if we're going to make it through this transition, we need to start thinking about our lives a little bit differently. And one of the interesting things that's happened, which is actually the genesis of this talk and why I decided that I maybe had something to talk about in the governance space again, is some folks have been going back and looking at the archaeological record again, because there's a lot of really interesting archaeology and research that's been done over the past 40 or 50 years about kind of the shape of the world and, and how we got here. And it turns out that the ideas that we have about history and about power structures and about the, um, I think it's the pack or something, um, but the, uh, the ideas that we have about the history of power and that kind of thing are uh, really kind of wrong. And why they're wrong is a very interesting story. Um, how many people here have read Graeber and Wenger's new book, The Dawn of Everything? A few, okay. So chunks of this are lifted from that. It's a great book. The rest of you should absolutely go, go and read it. Also, uh, James Scott's Against the Grain. Um, come up to me afterwards if you want the names again. So anyway, so let's start talking about freedom, right? Freedom is a really interesting concept. It's one of the things that we're very um, bent on preserving in this transition. We talk a lot about human rights and all of this stuff. Um, so where did our idea of freedom come from? Well, it turns out that most of the original sources for this came from Roman authors. Like, those were the authorities that um, Enlightenment scholars drew from very directly when they kind of coined the set of ideas that became modern human rights. Now, every single one of those Roman authors owned slaves. And to own something meant that you were allowed to kill them. That was the baseline from which they constructed their idea of freedom. Freedom is the ability to own things absolutely and destroy them at will. So yeah, we want to own things, and that's why we're killing the world, because that's our idea. Our idea of freedom is the ability to kill things. So maybe we should look at other ideas of freedom, because that one seems like it's starting to become slightly problematic at scale. Um, so yeah, human rights showed up in the Enlightenment, became the new way that we frame the structure of society, um, along with a bunch of other ideas like democracy and other things, which have panned out, you know, better and worse in different places. Um, but we're kind of at the end of the Enlightenment. So about 12, 12 and a half years ago, 11, I don't remember, some time ago at CCC, Quinn and I did a talk called No Neutral Ground in the Burning World where we talked about the end of the Enlightenment. And that's basically what we've been living through, right? The rise of large-scale online disinformation is kind of the end of that rational society, right? We're going back into the age of gods and monsters, where you pick which mythology you believe in, and that process happens largely outside of the kind of institutional trust structure, all of the other things that were the core of the you know, the way that society was supposed to work. Um, so now that it's dead, let's look about where the Enlightenment came from, and specifically where ideas of the world came from. There are basically two models of, um, two models of how, like, what's the, what's the default state of human nature, right? There's Hobbes. Human nature is, you know, the, the, the base human nature is the battle of all against all. It's red in tooth and claw. Um, and there's Rousseau, which said that human nature is miraculous and blissful, but as soon as you get organization, as soon as you get any large-scale population, well, then you have to have power over. Then you have to have hierarchy. It's impossible to have, you know, even a village without a village headman. Um, and that, that pair of... And Rousseau mostly won, right? Rousseau mostly won that fight. And, uh, you know, and then Hobbes is pulled out when the fascists need to kill some people. Um, but that was basically the philosophical work that was required, because this, this happened in the context where Europe was leaving the feudal age, right? And it was starting to move towards early market economies. And it needed a conceptual framework to move from the divine right of kings to the divine right of money. 
And this provided the conceptual framework that all of this hierarchy and power over and a strong state with a monopoly on violence, well, these are simply inescapable conditions of the world. There is no alternative. And we still believe that there is no alternative to capitalism, right? You have to exist in this hierarchical structure if you want, I don't know, sewage removal, all of the things that we expect in the world now, right? It's a, it's a, it's a core of infrastructure. So where did that idea come from? What was Rousseau reading? What was he responding to? So it turns out that at the time, the French were uh, spreading out across Quebec, and there were trappers and soldiers and priests and, and you know, all sorts of folks who were talking to a bunch of the natives. And they were writing about what those folks told them. And some of those folks even came to France and lectured widely, you know, learned French, came to France and lectured. And there was a very, very different model of freedom there. Um, and so this is, where, this is where the dawn of everything, like the single set of passages which kind of justified that book for me were a bunch of interactions and, and you know, even you know, translated texts from Kadarandak, who was a Wendat statesman in the 1680s or so. And this was someone who was, you know, had, had very effective rhetoric, was very clear-spoken, um, and was clearly very used to arguing his case, talking about a different idea of freedom, talking about a completely different structure of society. And so their idea of freedom was started with one principle. No one should ever have to follow an order. There can be no orders in the society. People are going to agree to do things together. That's totally fine. But no top-down orders ever. Now, if you take that completely seriously, right, if you build your entire society on the concept that no one should ever be coerced under any conditions to do anything, well, the first thing you have to get rid of is hunger, right? Because a starving man has to follow orders, right? You cannot have hunger and freedom. They are immediately incompatible. And there's a bunch of other things. You have to have, you know, care, right? You have to, you know, if you, if you are hurt, you still can't follow an order, okay. Now that means, you know, everyone has a duty to provide certain kinds of care and labor to make sure that each other can remain free. Um, and they also had an idea that, that um, you should be able to travel and you should be able to build your own social structures, your own kind of um, frames of, of kind of social combination. And so the, um, the travel thing ended up being, there's this uh, kind of Moedi lodge system across most of the eastern, of eastern North America, where you'd have the bear clan and the eagle clan and whatever. And uh, anyone from your clan was, had a hospita hospitality obligation to you. So you could walk from Quebec to, you know, like New Orleans. And you might not speak the language, but there would be someone there who had an obligation to hospitality to you. And it enabled this kind of freedom of, well, you know, there are too many people here who disagree, so I'm just going to get up and leave. I'm just going to walk away. Um, if you haven't read Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, it's also recommended. Um, and the, the freedom of social combinations is another interesting one, because it turns out from the archaeological evidence that we have, and this is, some of this is guesswork being pieced together, um, the, that social structure was an intentionally created reaction to a uh, somewhere like pre-1000 CE dictatorship, you know, theocratic dictatorship across most of, uh, most of kind of Eastern North America. And as that society eventually broke down, a bunch of people were like, okay, that sucked. That sucked so much that we're never going to let this happen again, and we're going to restructure our entire society so that it doesn't happen and it's not possible. And the interesting thing is that precise thing of saying, okay, all of the base tenets of our society, we're going to throw them out, we're going to start over again, has happened so many times. It is probably, it is one of the fundamental things that makes us human is that we introspect on our system of governance and our way of living together and we change it. And we do that until recently, we do that very, very frequently. There were, in fact, a, a bunch of um, 
indigenous groups in a bunch of different parts of the world that intentionally, often seasonally, would swap their entire system of governance. You know, often they'd live in a small band structure that might be um, very democratic in the summers, and then they'd come into a, a theocratic or autocratic winter structure. Um, but the, you know, the people who were in charge in the winters had no power in the summertime. And this was, again, our best guess, if we look at where those things came from, that, was, that wasn't, oh, this is the primitive state of nature. That was a bunch of people who were like, ah, if we build things this way, then those fuckers don't get uppity and try to stick around. So we're going we're gonna to intentionally structure our society to avoid the persistent concentration of power. Um, and one of the other things that's interesting that comes out of looking at the, at the archaeological research is this idea that... Um, well, you know, as soon as you have complexity, you need hierarchy. So the time from the first city, first thing that we would call a city, to the first city where there's, where there's archaeological evidence of a hierarchical government is about 2,000 years. It took a very long time for us to start having those two forms go together. And even after that point, Many, many, many civilizations persisted non-hierarchically in a bunch of different contexts or tried a just wild panoply of governance styles. Now, the reason this hasn't been, you know, the reason this isn't uh, more sort of common knowledge is that looking at the archaeological record in this way requires syncretism across a huge number of sites and it requires, it requires kind of re-evaluation from first principles, which is basically not publishable in an academic context because it's too far out of, any, of anyone's lane. Um, the book that Graeber and Wenger wrote was basically their hobby project. They're well like, okay, we can publish this in the popular press, we're going to do the work as seriously as we can, but it's academically useless because it's, it's, um, it's considered unserious, right? It's too big of a, it's too big of a picture that we're drawing. Um, so we've gotten trapped in this Rousseauian model of how we interpret archaeological remains, etc. Um, and the interesting thing, like, if we, if, we look at what, um, if we look at what oligarchs do, right, and to a certain extent what institutions do, but especially what oligarchs do, is they're trying to freeze structures, right? They break down the institutions that support a pro-social world, and then they use, you know, market manipulation, monopoly power, etc., to create these frozen structures where where political evolution can't happen, right? They do large-scale media manipulation. Like, there's all of this, this whole set of tools which is designed to preserve their power over time. Um, and this is one of the things that we're now running into. Um, but anyway, so the Rousseau looked at this challenge of this, oh, actually, power over isn't necessary, you know, um, and one of the interesting things, this, this enlightenment ideal of rational debate. Well, it turns out when you have a society that, where no one can give each other an order, you end up getting very good at convincing people to do things because you still need collective action. Like, you know, there are still crops that need to be harvested. There's still population movements. There's still all of this kind of stuff. So you have a bunch of people who basically spend a big chunk of their life in a debate society. And... Weird, right after that contact, that's contact that started popping up in European coffee shops. And the books that, uh, the books that uh, a lot of this material came in were read by every intellectual in Europe at the time. They were, they were kind of the hot new thing, the hot new structure. And what Rousseau and others created with the Enlightenment was basically, okay, so we have market society, and we have this, what feels like a catastrophically dangerous philosophical challenge to the structure of power, to the idea of power over. Well, shit, we need to come up with something. And what they built was this enlightenment structure, which was designed to provide just enough freedom to sort of contain these ideas that actually we don't have to be serfs and we could live in a, in a more radically free way while still making room for, at the time, the kings and the merchants and the entire structure of power under that, right? Human rights are sort of a trap 
They're a trap that's designed to maintain the power structure. It's, it's the right to the bare minimum, not the right to everything. Um, so, the thing which was really fascinating there was this direct experience of what is the mental state, what is the interiority of someone living in a non-ownership society, right? Of living in a world where you own basically nothing. You, have, you certainly have like, the right to use all of the possessions which are close to you, um, but even there, there was a whole, uh, there was a whole very deeply held um, uh, belief that, well, if someone has a dream about a thing, right? If someone has a dream about, like, oh, I dreamt of your, um, your comb, well, then you have to give it to them because, you know, it's, it's very important that those kinds of dreams are realized. Now, now this, obviously, this could be abused, but, you know, this is, you know, this is baked into a very deep social contract that, no, no, you, you, you would never do that falsely, right? That would be completely unjustifiable and, you know, runs counter to a lot of our ideals. But it means that, yes, your possessions do kind of come and go. But because you are, exist in this social milieu, which has an incredibly strong contract that says that you will be taken care of, it doesn't matter. And one of the interesting things as we look at moving into this time of massive ecosystemic, geopolitical, ecological disruption is that our stuff isn't going to keep us safe. No one in here is going to be safe because you own a Tesla with a bioweapons-grade air filtering system. That's not going to fucking keep you alive. And it's not a question of, oh, you own an AR-15. Guess what? You can still fucking starve, asshole. Um, you know, none of this stuff is going to keep you alive. What is going to keep you alive is adaptive work with the people around you, with the community, with the infrastructural context that you live in, and whoever else ends up needing to move into that. Because if you try to maintain that hard border, you're back at your stuff keeping you alive again, and eventually that's going to fail. And eventually, when that border does fail, they're going to be a bit less happy about the genocide bit. So you probably are better off figuring out how to actually live together. Um, and I think that... You know, knowing that, we, knowing that it is possible to do large-scale coordination without power over, knowing that it is possible to live a life where you have that feeling of, of deep personal safety without the, without the hard governance structure is incredibly powerful. Um, now, we are in an era of automation. We are in an era of permissionification and securityification of all infrastructure, right? Um, if you go to a refugee camp, you are required to use biometrics if you want to eat. If you're not identifiable, you starve, right? And, it, you know, and, and it's a small step from that to, well, you know, that post you made, we don't like it, so you don't eat today. And it doesn't take, it doesn't take eat, not eating for very many days for you to change your you know, opinions on what you're willing to express politically. Um, so if we want to keep freedom, we probably need to start rethinking and rebuilding some of these infrastructural systems that allow that kind of power over. Um, if you look at the history of um, European colonialism, one of the interesting moments was the introduction of the telegraph, because the telegraph turned colonies into empires, because it allowed for the centralization of power. It allowed for the centralization of information at a speed where governance decisions could be made in one place in Europe instead of you know, every, every colony, every you know, outpost, et cetera, being basically kind of on its own. You know, sure, that you'll get a letter in six months telling you what you should have done, but it's not like the guy can, pro you know, can sack you in any practical way, whereas if he can just send a telegram to the you know, separate, uh, separately commanded security force that he has on site, it's a very different story and a very, you know, much shorter, uh, shorter enforcement window. So, the... And the other thing is that reinvention of governance, right? That idea of change, that idea that we should change our social combinations, not because the new one is going to be better, but because the difference disables that accumulative function of power, right? Changing, like, you know, if we, 
let's say every, every other generation, we completely changed the inheritance structure for property. You know, we all agreed that like, oh, you know, now it's collective, now it's this, now it's that, who knows, right? And it doesn't matter which system we pick, but it changes, right? Now it's a lottery, you inherit somebody else's property, whatever. Um, you don't get dynastic wealth then, right? You've immediately eliminated dynastic wealth. But, and there were, there were you know, so many different versions of this where reinvention is a critical function. And so anything that we build that, mit, that works against reinvention is probably going to be used against us. Because, yeah, we are, a, we are a 1% room here, almost certainly, but we're not a tenth of a percent room, or a hundredth of a percent room, or a millionth of a percent room. Um, which means that we're, not, you know, we're the people building the tools that are going to be used to hurt us. We're not the people who are going to benefit from those tools. You know, first, uh, first in the periphery and then in the core, you know, we've watched the U.S. do this with... Um, you know, policing tactics that they first used in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now they use, you know, now they use them at home, and now they increasingly are using them against, you know, shock white people, sometimes with money. Um, you know, we shouldn't be shocked about that because that's what power does, that's how it works. So we should maybe think about building those tools in the first place. Um, so I am an anarchist, but, um, and I'm also a communist, but, it turns out that revolutions are generally bad. They do not work very well. Um, the historical record for them is pretty awful, and you know, the, 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 the personally viewed, very current record for them is also pretty awful on average. Um, and that's basically because people still need to eat, right? So you have an immediate governance problem, right? The day of the glorious revolution, and then the next day, we need to move a lot of food around. Shit, how do we do it? Okay, who knows how this system works? This system is designed infrastructurally around an assumption of hierarchy. The railroads need to run. The factories need to run. We're going to put a lot of the same people in charge because they are the only ones who claim to know how the job works, etc. cetera. Um, and it's very difficult to have a revolutionary structure that, you know, that actually changes the form of society without people starving in the meantime. Now, if you're willing to have people starve, you can actually change the form of society. And we have done this a bunch because we're good at genocides and we like them. But maybe that's also not a great idea, A, if you don't like genocides, but also if you're trying to manage an incredibly complex resource transition where you cannot afford to fuck shit up like that, right? We have an amazingly narrow window where we get to keep globally organized human civilization. And if we spend it all on revolutions and wars, things are not looking good. Things are not looking good. Um, so, and then the, the, then there's, so that's the communist way. And the anarchist way is, well, we're gonna tell people about the possibility, like I'm doing right now, we're gonna tell people about the possibility that you could all just live freely in your own combinations. And once we've told enough people about this, then the day will come where everyone's just like, well, yeah, let's just go do that. And there's a little step in there. You know, we've gotten a lot better at telling people about things, you know. Um, I am seeing a lot more anarchist propaganda online these days. It's lovely, but also, and then a miracle happens, if you remember the old New Yorker cartoon, is not actually a plan for social transition that gets us to carbon zero in seven and a half fucking years. Um, so it's going to be a muddle, right? We know it's, the best case is this is a muddle and we get some things massively wrong because this is a wildly complex problem, right? We can't solve it. It's not a problem that has a solution. It's a problem that has an ongoing set of maintenance actions that we will find out if it worked after the fact. And, you know, who the fuck knows, maybe we get lucky. Um, so, but we also need to do something about the oligarchs. And we need to do something about hypercapitalism that is the beast that created this entire thing in the first place. So, well, what do you do when you need to solve a problem and you don't know how to solve it and you're kind of making shit up as you go? Well, you generally build a prototype because prototyping works pretty effectively. Now, we don't have a ton of time, so probably what you do if you have a bunch of people and a bunch of problems is you build a lot of prototypes all in parallel. 
you know, it's the shotgun method. You throw a bunch of shit at the wall, and some of it sticks, and then you do that. Um, and so we should perhaps consider that, like, if you are in this room, you probably have either financial or lifestyle flexibility of a certain kind, also because you can come and live in a field for a week. Um, and you're probably interested in sort of weird shit. And you have a life um, for a short period of time before the ecosystem breaks down and you probably die starving along with everybody else. So why not spend that life fucking around and finding out? And, you know, whatever you've been told about the structure of the world, take a look at it and see if that thing that you've been told supports the oligarchs continuing to grind us all into dust. Because it probably does, because that's what we're all told all the time. And then maybe go try something else. I don't know. I don't fucking care what you try. Just do something different, right? Prototype a new way of interacting with power and the structure of the world and see what comes out of it. And one of the things that will come out of it, and this is, this is also very relevant for us because this is a room full of tool builders, right? And there is such a thing as the revolution of the tool builder because tools encode politics. They encode ways of thinking about the world. The telegraph encodes empire, right? Um, you know, one, and, and we don't necessarily know what those tools mean when we build them, right? It turns out that um, Al-Qaeda is basically a Facebook page with a bunch of IEDs, right? It's, it's not that much more than a meme to the extent that the United States government's standard of whether or not you're an Al-Qaeda member is whether or not you say you're an Al-Qaeda member. That's it. That's literally all you got to do. It's like anonymous. Al-Qaeda is anonymous. It's the same fucking thing, right? So if, if I, to, to steal another thing from Quinn, if I, if I say that, well, this is, the, uh, this is the, the radically queer branch of Al-Qaeda up here, all our bombs are glitter bombs, I'm now an Al-Qaeda member because that's how it fucking works. Right? That's literally the way the governance structure works. Um, so we don't necessarily know what the tools we build, we build are going to mean. Um, and we're going to have to do some finding out. But it's very difficult to find out if you also don't have a lived context in which those tools work. So maybe go make friends with a bunch of people who aren't in this room, who are very different from you, and try doing weird shit in your lives together, and then try figuring out what are the tools that we need that we don't have, right? What are the, you know, what are the capabilities that are missing in our technical ecosystem that happen to be within your grasp or the grasp of whoever you happen to know, um, and then see where that takes you. Um, one of the things, so I've, I spent a while working on the Briar project. Um, Briar is an asynchronous messaging tool that deals with latencies roughly between a microsecond and a month designed for very hard security contexts. And that came out of um, watching the student protests in London. So there was a tool, called, or my involvement in it, um, there was a tool called Suki, um, and Suki was an anti-kettling tool, because it turns out that cops are great dealing with 100,000 person march, because that's kind of the way they think. That's an institutional hierarchy. Yes, there's a problem. We will throw bodies at the problem. And they're really, really wildly bad at dealing with 20 simultaneous 5,000 person marches all around a city when it's a bunch of college kids who can run at a fair clip, and just like, as soon as the cops show up, they vanish. Um, so, Suki came out of, there was a really bad kettle, and um, somebody built the tool to basically just let people, you know, phone in reports and watch where the kettle happened. And then they told people, hey, there's a kettle forming here, don't go there. And so they didn't, and it was mayhem in the most glorious way possible. Um, and I took a look at it, and I was like, this is very interesting, but this is like a Google Maps mashup. They're going to fucking hammer you the next time you do this. OK, so how do we, you know, what would a tool look like that was fully decentralized, that was actually just running on everybody's phone, uses, you know, um, local Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever, you know, GSM uplinks if it's, if it's there, um, and that makes the source of all this data pretty untrackable. And then uh, a friend of a friend was already working on Briar, and was like, aha, that's an RPC layer. That's an RPC layer that deals with this kind of you know, hard systemic problem. And the tool has moved very slowly. We still don't have that version. I'm not super involved at this point. Um, but someday I would like to go back 
and take that tool and say, okay, so what if we had, what would it look like to take the DoD common operating picture, which is a battle space sensor fusion system that takes, um, you know, information off a bunch of different war fighters. This is their way of talking about it. Um, you know, literally everything from a heart rate monitor to a, a you know, and a, and a GPS location off an individual grunt to uh, space-based radar and figures out what does this picture build together? Who needs to know about this? Get them the information in the form that they need to understand it, right? So what does that look like for anarchists? I don't know. And what does that tool do in the world? No fucking clue. You might build it and fuck around and find out. Um, so that's kind of what I'm suggesting that we do is fuck around and find out. But the problem with fucking around and finding out is that the oligarchs are still there. And they're looking at these tools that we're building. And they're being like, well, that's an interesting tool. I wonder how I can make that a tool that helps oligarchs. Has anyone here heard of Web3? Fuck those people entirely. We used to have, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we used to have this really cool, burgeoning, decentralized tech scene that was looking at all of the cool things that we could do if we turned the internet inside out again and, you know, that take advantage of this permissionless innovation and break down all these silos. And then the Bitcoin assholes moved in, and now anytime somebody says decentralization, oh, but where's your token? So, fuck around and fight out, shoot a Web3 developer today, <laughs> build a new system in the world, and possibly we might get to keep globally organized civilization. So I think we have a bit of time for questions or comments or wild rants. Please, no vegetables. <laughs> so we, we do have time for questions and answers. If you have a question or a comment or whatever, uh, please walk up to the microphones and um, ask a question. Um, I see from, from, we don't have a question from the internet yet, unfortunately. Yes, please come up to the microphone, walk closely to the microphone and speak into it. Thank you. Hello. Um, you said that um, revolutions are kind of a bad idea because it doesn't work. But you also said that um, societies in the past used to change every time and we would try many different things. Do you not think that revolution is the way to do that? Like, if something breaks down, bends down, then there is space to create something new. If there isn't, how can something new come up? So, partially what I'm proposing is that we build parallel things next to it, because part of the problem with revolutions, and like, A, revolutions do work if you're willing to accept a genocide as the cost of the revolution. I am generally anti-genocide. Um, I feel fairly comfortable in that position. But also the problem is that revolutions, successful revolutions with genocides are incredibly infrastructurally disrupting. And while we might have one right now, it makes it very unlikely that we're going to hit carbon zero in seven and a half years. So it's probably a bad idea right now. But in parallel, like, where's the space? Like, we, we, everything is built. Like, there's no land. Uh, where, where would that in parallel be? I don't know, but like, like I said, I do not have answers for you today. Maybe I have interesting questions, although one of the things is, as large-scale societal structures start breaking down, you get cracks. You get places where you can do things for a little while. Is it enough? I don't know. Let's find out. Thank you. Uh, hi, so my question is the following statement. Uh, Briar has been used on protests in Poland already Great. successfully as a, uh, as a backup for regular cellular yep. communication, any other IM, uh, just, just in case the cell towers were shut down or anything like that, right? So this thing is already happening. The, the yeah, Briar yeah. is already being used as, as this tool. Yeah, no, it is yeah. like yeah. things are moving. It's just, you know, yeah. Have you seen how the uh, Ukrainians manage their crowdsourced resources? No, I haven't. Um, but I, I, I have some guesses. 
And like I've seen what uh, Occupy Sandy did, for instance, which was a, another fascinating case of a horizontal resource distribution network. So what happens is that you have organizations that collect resources from all over the world. And the way they distribute those to groups is they look at your reputation on social media. You're a group, you post some videos of you bombing fascists, and that makes you a credible group to send resources to. So what I'm hearing is the Russians are going to start gaming YouTube a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Just DMCA take down all the bombing videos. And, anyway, but yeah, no. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, reputation systems are complicated. Uh, they're fine as long as you don't try to formalize them. Because the first rule of building a reputation system is that no one who has a reputation has time to interact with a reputation management system. So they kind of don't work when you formalize them, but informal ones we use all the time. Uh, thank you for a thought-provoking thought, uh, talk, I should say. So I was wondering if you um, are aware of the work of Philip Pettit, who has a particular conception of freedom. No. So it's a... Um, we, of course, know the two conceptions of freedom that Berlin always talks about, sort of liberal uh, ideas. So the liberal idea of freedom is that you are only free if you are free of people interfering with what you want to do. Very liberal idea. And his idea, that is a very old idea as well, is that you're only free if you're free from domination. Mm -hmm. So that's very similar to what you said. I think yep. slightly different. Because I think he believes that... Um, that that is possible um, in a democracy. So there can still be orders, probably, but the, but the orders can never be arbitrary. They should be organized in a way that is non-arbitrary, so that you can count on it, so I don't know, in yeah. a state with a rule of law or all these yeah. things. That, I guess, is a slightly different from your anarchist point of view. So I'm very curious yeah. to hear your thoughts about, is this non-ownership society possible maybe in a democratic state, or what are your thoughts about de democracy in general? I mean, I think, I believe in the idea of obligate geographic infrastructural collectives, right? So if you are trying to manage water, you have a problem which is at the scale of a watershed. You cannot manage that via a group that is smaller than everyone who lives in the watershed, right? Because that is the shape of the program. Similarly, we have, a, we have an atmosphere shed, Right? So we have a, you know, we, we will, you know, we have a global obligate resource management problem that requires cooperation from everyone. However, that doesn't mean that we need a global government that manages everything in our lives. It means that we, man we need a global government that manages everything that we put into that global commons. So I think the, one of the biggest problems with the state is that we each only live in one of them. We should live in hundreds of different states that are structured around hundreds of different problems that are actually independent of each other, right? Yes, it means wildly more overhead. However, if we stop spending all of our time making marketing videos and doing whatever the fuck other stuff we do, you're going to spend a lot more time in... Well, you're not going to spend more time in meetings. You're just going to spend the same time in very different kinds of meetings. Right? It's not like we don't have the social capacity. You know, the, the joke about the problem with socialism is it takes too many evenings. That's fine. Do it during the day instead. Um, so yes, we, we probably do need structures that, for instance, yes, the, the Global Atmospheric Collective probably needs to have recourse to coercive violence around things that people put into the air. It'd be great if they didn't need to, but they're probably going to need that. However, they shouldn't have it anywhere else. How we achieve that fracturing is left as an exercise to the reader. Last question, please. Okay. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Okay. So, yeah, so my question is kind of related to the first question. Uh, so, and, and it, sure. So my question is kind of related to the first question. And it basically boils down to the idea, is, is it possible to do... Um, an anarchist revolution, right? So when I, when I look what happened to in Arab Spring, for example, all the revolutions failed, basically. But what came out of it was basically what you were describing, like anarchy, people learned about a different way. And I think, and a lot of people think, it will you know, pay off in like 30, 40 years or something. So that's... Maybe. I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not against the idea. 
but we have a very short-term problem right now. Um, I, don't know the, I don't know the answer to the larger question. I have no idea. Um, I think that if you... It feels very likely to be messy unless you've done some of the prep work in parallel, right? If you have a set of social structures that could provide an alternate organizing mechanism for whatever set of infrastructure you need to run, that you can swap in relatively quickly, right? You know, your first 100-day plan for after the revolution, right, is, well, okay, we allow certain forms of hierarchical organization for critical infrastructure to continue, and then we transition them through into, you know, whatever, right? But, and, and this, is the, this is partially the exigent nature of revolutions, right? You spend all of your capacity planning for how do you get to the revolution. And it's very difficult to have the practical 100-day plan and the transition team ready when you haven't started doing the shooting yet, but that's kind of when you need to do it. And so I think what I would want to see from an anarchist revolution is a lot more organization. <laughs> Because that's what makes it actually fucking work. Thank you all. <laughs>